Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi, wa sahbihi, wa man wa la. This has become something of an annual institution now, my little pep talk in the middle of the CMC donors uh, retreat. Uh, it's been only 24 hours or so since we started, but already we're bonding into a wonderful fraternity, alhamdulillah. It's uh, great to see uh, so many familiar faces. I want to start just by uh, reminding you that CMC is not just about training the new generation of imams and thought leaders for uh, Britain's Muslim communities, but we have a very strong research dimension as well. So I thought I'd just um, make a happy announcement, um, first time it's been plugged publicly. Our former dean and still one of our research fellows, uh, Dr. Michael Bedine, Muhammad Esad, many of you will remember him with great affection. He's now in retirement. Uh, his great book has just come out, uh, just last week, with I.B. Taurus, Redrawing the Middle East, Sir Mark Sykes' Imperialism and the Sykes-Pico Agreement. And it's hot stuff. It's now the 100th anniversary of the um, uh, shenanigans that created the modern Middle East. Uh, he was basically the man who drew those straight lines across the desert and created Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and so forth. And uh, Sidi Mohammed has gone behind the scenes to family and other archival material, not before seen, to explain uh, Britain's role in creating what turned out to be an extraordinarily uh, unhappy and unstable settlement. So um, worth getting, I think. Um, and an indication of the, uh, the ongoing research activity of the college. So what I want to do this evening uh, isn't really that academic. It's an odd kind of lecture, more perhaps in the nature of a, a documentary, I suppose, with lots of uh, interesting pictures. Um, and in a sense, it's going to be quite sort of modern about the contemporary period. I suppose I'll be reflecting on the fact that if the old mind, body, spirit, ternary, uh, which historically tended to define human creatures in just about every culture, um, their cultural becoming has now been really unbalanced or even disrupted by modern uh, physicalism, um, the emphasis on the idea that matter is all that really is, um, then the body seems to be increasingly the center of our modern concerns. Um, remember the recent parliamentary debate which recommended body image lessons in all British schools. A major cause of juvenile depression seems to, do with, seems to be to do with uh, body image issues. Cosmetic uh, surgery is a booming industry. Self-harm among girls is on the up. And politics increasingly is body politics. Key issues for us today to look at the headlines seem to revolve not around truth or the meaning of life, but around questions of the body, sexual identity, and so on. It's part of the zeitgeist. So what I want to do uh, to sort of ponder this is to, to take us back 100 years or so uh, to a very different time, but also a modern time, when very rapid social change was responding to the collapse in Europe's older Christian belief systems. Physics and Darwin had convinced very many people that God had died and the race was on to find an alternative way of satisfying the human need for morality and meaning. And very many of the 20th century outcomes of that race turned out to be, in the end, genocidal and harrowing. With the return of the far right today across uh, Europe and even in the world, where I think justified in thinking carefully about those times and what it is about the modern project in those days that generated such catastrophic outcomes and where some of the greatest minds of the time went so terribly wrong. Evidently, the loss of the spirit leaves us just with our bodies, our physical selves, uh, and they do tend to grant materialistic ideologies, uh, potentially, I guess, totalitarian sway over us. The spirit, after all, and all that goes with it, geist, allows difference. Science has a habit of seeking a single correct solution. So when we combine this totalizing and reductionist aspect of science with the liberal desire for maximal options and refusal of closure, we have one of the defining antinomies and sources of tension in modern culture. Science is about the truth of things, 
but modernity wants there to be an indefinite number of truths that are subjectively defined by each individual equal subject in liberal society. And this tension um, caused this systemic uh, dysfunction in Europe in much of the 20th century. And we can see that starting to creep back nowadays. So let's go way back in time um, to where, not where it all began, but at least our contemporary sense of it's a kind of folk idea we have of ancient times as representing a time when body and spirit were in harmony, uh, a kind of happy pagan Eden where nature and soul and thought were harmoniously integrated. And uh, a lot of anthropological work in primal societies does seem to confirm our, our general cultural conviction that there was an ancient world of sacrality determined by cycles of sun and moon, the movement of the seasons, growth and decay, and humanity's general sense of appurtenance to a great cosmic wheel, what Mircea Eliade called the myth of eternal return. Everything was cyclical, and we were uh, harmoniously incorporated within uh, the cycle of the natural world. And this goes not back to the dawn of recorded history, but as far as we can tell, to Neolithic or Paleolithic times. It's how we were, and we have a strong kind of odd nostalgia in our culture for, for that time. And that's been one of the, the key tensions in the 20th century narrative about progress. Um, recently, there's of course been in this country and elsewhere a turn to neo-paganism, witchcraft, and more new agey dimensions of the environmental movement. So we see that there is even today, uh, this is a Victorian image, but uh, even today there is a strong attempt to remember or recreate that somewhat sort of mythologized Eden. Um, but here you have, this is actually Alma Tadema. Is it in the Tate Gallery? It might be. That's where it ought to be anyway. This is uh, uh, his painting Sappho and Alcestis, very characteristic of the kind of tension in European art in the late uh, 19th century, uh, where on the one hand, there was a desire to return to a kind of idealized medieval period of knights errant and damsels, damsels in distress. And much of the uh, uh, sort of Victorian Gothic nostalgia was about that, but also uh, existing in tension with uh, a desire or kind of nostalgia for a pre-Christian kind of pagan environment where there was thought to be uh, harmony, where um, the European quest increasingly in, in the modern period to draw away from medieval strictures, um, monastic inhibitions towards a, some kind of valorizing of the body and its organic, organic and natural erotic functions tended to, to, to provide a very significant clash. So this is where it seemed to come to an end for many in Europe. And one of the huge debates for Europeans as they drew away from their Christian heritage in the 19th, early 20th century, although this is um, obviously an older image, this is Tiepolo. Uh, St. Catherine of Siena, was how to square the modern desire to somehow re-encounter nature through some kind of harmonized human sense of belongingness, a pertinence to the natural realm, with the European desire to be in harmony with uh, the dominant Christian narrative of monotheistic Europe. And this tension um, became the reason for the apostasy of very many educated Europeans, um, as we shall see. Here's a fun image. Uh, this is present day. Um, with the decline of the Christian paradigm in Britain, the older paradigm of pagan Britain is breaking surface again. So paganism is possibly Britain's fastest growing religion. This is the Beltane celebrations, I think last year in Edinburgh. That's one of the biggest um, Beltane rituals. I think this is the bit where, probably not many of you go to Beltane, but. Um, uh, it's the bit where uh, the Queen of the May is led in procession to meet the Green Man. If you're into modern British paganism, this is a big deal. Uh, it, it represents, again, the desire of Europeans to reconnect to some form of spirituality that incorporates nature, the seasons, eros, and so forth. It's post-Christian, but not post-religious. This is an important transition in uh, modern Europe. And some people who go to these things take it absolutely deadly seriously. Other people treat it as just a kind of rave or a kind of cabaret experience. It, it often, the Edinburgh one in particular, which is one of the biggest, they have a Beltane in Cambridge, but Edinburgh is much bigger. 
um, it tends to be very uh, sort of cinematic almost in the way in which it's choreographed. And of course, the pagan tradition didn't continue in England. It was uh, truncated, amputated in the Middle Ages. So this is a kind of recreation. Um, I doubt very much whether many of these people are actually in contact with the spirit world or with sprites and fairies and leprechauns and so forth. Unlikely, but who knows? Maybe some of the old spells still work their magic. But this is an important transition that's happening now in, uh, in European culture. But so that tension, Christianity perceived as being the termination of this, the happy human relationship to the natural world and reproduction, uh, uh, and the, the possibility of some kind of pagan recrudescence as the alternative. Uh, but there's another alternative, which is represented here. Um, it'll take you some time to work out what this is. These are both by Rubens. Uh, and Western culture always liked to define itself through a kind of dichotomizing process against a dark other. And when Roman paganism collapsed, this ugo other was often figured as fleshly, bodily, sensual, natural, uh, opposing the Christian self, the soul, which was to be pure and transcendent. So very often, even in the decoration of medieval cathedrals and churches in, in Europe, you see there's always an iconographic tension between nature and the risen Christ. Um, it's a dualism that isn't really derived, obviously, from the Gospels. It probably comes more from Plato, ultimately. Um, but it uh, picked a number of biblical dichotomies as figures of this. Representations of two modalities of our humanity are on the uh, left in the picture. Um, you have Abraham the patriarch and Sarah. And on the, uh, they are banishing into the wilderness, of course, Hajar. This is the story in Genesis, Genesis 23 or somewhere. But it's, uh, of course, the founding moment of Islam. And for the authors of the biblical text, we didn't really know who composed them. But uh, this was figured as an othering of the, the Gentile other that was thenceforth to be the Ishmaelite, ultimately the Saracen. Uh, and of course, in the Islamic tradition, that bears fruit ultimately in the Holy Prophet and the great lineage of Islam. On the right, you have Rubens again, uh, but this time he is glorifying a woman who's not a symbol of rejection, but a symbol of election. This is the assumption of the Virgin Mary. Obviously, he wasn't an eyewitness to the event. He probably wouldn't have seen exactly that scene, but uh, it's a very Baroque, colorful, exuberant, flying babies everywhere. Uh, and there she is, ascending to heaven because she can't die, because she's born free of original sin, so she's lifted up. And you can see that if you juxtapose these paintings, although they're not really supposed to be seen together, but it's part of a European moment which treated these two women as figures of two alternate possibilities of humanity. Hajar looks kind of pregnant, and she's looking down, and she's going off into nature, virgin nature. She belongs with a natural world. Um, because it's it, uh, Isaac who is to be the son of the promise, and Ishmael is just the, the, the son of nature, the child of nature. And the Virgin Mary, of course, is leaving nature, flying up into the Empyrean, carried up by these flying babies, <coughs> uh, and is looking up. She's not looking down, she's looking up. And the color for Hajar is red, which is the color of the senses. <coughs> and the Virgin Mary, of course, already has the color of blue, which is the color of heaven. That's a natural habitat. So as well as the tension in European culture between the pagan thing about nature and the Christian thing about mortification, transcendence, priestly, celibacy, monasticism, uh, you have this other tension, which is also very much certainly in the medieval European mind between the Hagerine, in other words, the Ishmaelite, who is always figured in West, the Western imagination as sensual. Um, even had a sensual paradise, which to medieval Christians seemed completely <laughs> freaky. Uh, and on the other side, the, the true covenant, the Virgin Mary. So two mothers, but indicating two very different forms of human, uh, human becoming. So Europe often has dealt with its issues of the other, not just in terms of the pagan other, 
which Christianity fought and which is now seems to be coming back, but also the Ishmaelite other, which is now also coming back, um, but in the form of all of you. There's a symptomatic piece of Victorian angst. Swinburne, more or less anti-Christian, uh, complaining about what Jesus in his understanding did, whereas once there had been an exuberant pluralistic paganism, now there is a kind of death. The body is to be repudiated. Swinburne, very fond of wine, women, and song, and everything is kind of gray. El Greco, it's like death. Christianity brought death. No more, no more fun. Um, so this, again, for the Victorians, was an absolutely vast tension and much of the drift of England towards uh, secularity. And of course, this college, Selwyn, was created by the Anglican Church to try and push back against that because um, it was a place where you could uh, be an Anglican but within the university and was founded almost deliberately against places like UCL and other places in London which were uh, deliberately secular. It's part of the, the, the fundamental tension of the 19th century. Uh, often this 19th century anxiety fixes on a particular figure. It's a kind of watershed between the old and the new. And this is the Roman emperor, uh, Julian the Apostate. Uh, dies in 363. This is the Roman emperor who tried to take the whole empire after it had been, uh, at least much of it had been Christianized, back to the supposed good old days of pagan diversity and the embedding of religious cults in nature. And the emperor, who um, spent some time with some of the great church fathers, he had big arguments with um, Gregory Nazianzus, for instance, one of the biggest ones, chose ultimately to repudiate the new ascetical monotheism and had himself formally repaganized and initiated into some of the mystery religions, the Eleusinian mysteries and so forth. And this again became a kind of icon for a lot of Europeans. Should we do the same? Should we go back to the days of the Roman Empire, which following the Renaissance everybody had seen as a kind of climax of civilization? Was it, as Gibbon suggested, uh, Christianity, which brought about the collapse of the Roman Empire through its insistence on an unrealistic asceticism and a total, totalitarian vision of, um, of, of theocracy. Um, but it wasn't only artists who were kind of thinking about this scandalous reversion to the old ways. Um, the, the famous Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen wrote a play about it, Emperor and Galilean, which he actually thought was his best achievement, his greatest work. It's not often staged in this country, and it's hard to see exactly what he thought he was doing when he was writing it, because to stage the whole thing would take about eight hours. That's a lot of intervals. Um, uh, but it was recently staged in the UK at uh, the National Theatre. Um, they, they amputated and truncated it down to about three and a half hours. Um, uh, Andrew Scott was uh, starring as Julian. You may remember him as Moriarty from the TV uh, 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 Sherlock, a very kind of conspiratorial figure. Um, Nabil Shaban, one of this country's best known actors, also plays a role as the, the emperor's predecessor. Key people were in it. And even in the kind of abbreviated 21st century uh, Islington friendly version, you still get a lot of theological and philosophical discussions and agonizing. So Basil of Caesarea turns up and has a battle with the guy who reconverts Julian to paganism, Maximus. And what it's all about is Ibsen just using it as a stage on which he can act out his own internal traumas about what is happening in Europe and his, his more or less monomaniac theme is the, the crisis of European selfhood, relationship to body, desire, nature, Christianity, <coughs> Hedda Gabler, <coughs> uh, the best known example of that. Um, and the idea of a kind of very puritanical Scandinavian uh, Protestantism suffocating human fulfillment under what Ibsen calls the doctrines of guilt and misery and denial. So it's a tragedy, of course, and it is fairly close to the historical record. Um, uh, Julian's legions make the mistake of many other 
uh, arrogant empires by invading Iraq, and they're actually defeated by Iraqi insurgents. And the final scene has uh, the emperor realizing that the old uh, ways are not going to be revived. Uh, something new is on its way. And he has this dialogue with his pagan counselor, which I regard as very suggestive. What exactly, as we ponder these words, and remember this is the climax of the greatest play <coughs> of the 19th century's greatest playwright. <coughs> this is how it goes. The emperor says, say it then, who shall conquer, the emperor or the Galilean? Christ, the church. And Maximus, that's his pagan confessor, says, both emperor and Galilean shall go down. If in our time, or hundreds of years hence, I know not, but it shall happen when the right man comes. O thou fool who hast drawn thy sword against the future, against that third empire where the two-sided will reign. The third empire, Messiah, not the kingdom of the Jewish people, but of the spirit, and the Messiah of the kingdom of the world. Logos in pan, pan in logos. Well, that's enigmatic. You can imagine even a national theater audience, half of them with PhDs and working. What on earth is this? This is looking to the future. The emperors turn back to the old pagan joyful dances and garlanded girls and esoteric ceremonies that celebrated nature um, has failed. But it looks as if it won't be the, the grey-skinned, uh, bloodless Christianity, which is the future, but something else is being forecast. The third empire, not the Jewish empire, spiritual empire, but also the kingdom of the world. So there's going to be some kind of saviour figure coming along. Logos in pan, pan in logos. In other words, logos, the spirit, the articulate spirit, and pan, the spirit of exuberant participation in the beauties of nature. These are to come together. Something or somebody is going to come. Well, for Muslims, of course, that's a very interesting prophecy with the quintessence of Ibsenism. Um, and it's really about his key angst. Victorian man is caught between spirit and flesh, two extremes, the strict Lutheranism of the Scandinavian North, and on the other hand, this charming paganism. Uh, but neither seem viable. A new messiah has to come. Now, for a lot of people in 19th century culture, of course, there would be a secular messiah, either Marx or Freud or somebody who would open up a new, a new way of interpreting things. But it may well be that Ibsen is here in some curious way, pointing the way forward to the founder of Islam, maybe Ishmaelite prophet who's descended from the girl, not in the blue dress, but in the red dress, offers a reintegration with nature and eros while maintaining the, the, the appeal of the rigorous monotheism of the, of the Hebrew prophets. So I find this to be a very teasing moment in the history of European literature. So in any case, Europe has another moment where it feels that it's had enough of uh, flagellation and renunciation. And the Renaissance is this very strange, very sudden rebirth. It's as if the, the natural world, which has been buried under kind of the stonework or the cement of the church fathers, has burst forth again, starting to put out new shoots. But very quickly, if you visit an Italian city and you look at what's happening in 1450 and then what's happening in 1480, suddenly it's as if all of the old gods have come back to life again. It's a very uh, curious uh, experience. It's as if in Islam, for instance, everybody had suddenly started filling their homes with pictures of Manat and Hubal and Allat. And very odd that the old pagan way suddenly became celebrated again, not believed in, but at least embraced as the, the interesting center of elite culture. And architecture suddenly changed. The Gothic died almost overnight. Everything started to look like ancient Rome again. Um, curious. Um, this, of course, is Botticelli. If you've been to the National Gallery, you'll have seen this. Venus and Mars, 1483. It's actually a very comical kind of depiction. I suppose superficially it's about the battle of the sexes, uh, which, as everybody knows, when the playing field is even, uh, women always win. So look at her. She's wise and composed. 
and he's kind of all undone. Uh, who are the, but there's mysteries. Who are these fauns who are trying to wake him up? Are they angels or are they devils? Mm, art historians can't work it out. Probably there's some Renaissance Neoplatonic allegory here about soul and matter. But here, woman seems to be identified with, with soul. The man is kind of playing the passive and unresponsive role. But what really matters here is that it's the end of medieval flagellant stories about the body and nature as mired in the gravitational field of sin. What you get with the Renaissance is a sudden, exuberant, loving rediscovery of the natural world. And really, from this time on, Europe's culture is shaped by this very odd often quite a rich dialectic between the resurrected classical heritage and the Western Christian legacy of monasticism and anti-physicalism. Yeah. But it wasn't just the pagan possibility that is bubbling up again and now leads to Beltane and all kinds of things in our culture. Uh, but it was also the Saracenic or the Ishmaelite possibility. Europe's other significant other. So in the Romantic era, uh, along with the stirrings of the emotions, the back to nature ideology that produces the, the pre-Raphaelite and the alienation from the, the world of steam engines and equations, the Romantic reaction, you have odd events like this. Again, this is not insignificant. Goethe is, you know, if Ibsen was the greatest playwright of the 19th century, Goethe is the greatest uh, poet of the preceding century, no mean figure. And here he is with his famous poem about the Ishmaelite prophet. So the Renaissance looked back to a Roman past. Uh, the Romantics sometimes did that as in Alma Tadema's picture, but also they looked east, to a Romantic east, a Morganland, either the Indic world or the Saracenic world. There was a new romanticism that, that found the Middle East to be particularly charming. Here they thought they could find a new wisdom which would compensate for the unspiritual nature of modern Europe, the physicalism of the new elite Western discourses of science and, and materialistic philosophy. So this is the Mohammed's Gesang. Uh, this, incidentally, is one of the two settings of the poem by Schubert, but there are other musicians who uh, um, put it to music as well. Um, yeah, there is, again, interesting moment, isn't it? This is the, the title page of the first edition of the Diwan, which uh, Goethe wrote, of which the Mohammed's Gesang is one of the, the highlights. He'd read a lot of rather gruesome German translations of Hafiz and other Persian poets, um, and decided to try his hand as a Diwan writer himself and got into it so much that the Arabic script is actually said to be Goethe's own uh, Arabic handwriting. Not perfect, but hey, he was a long way from the nearest place where you could get an ijaza in calligraphy. Um, so another curious event, but get, to go to the heart of this, what we find is, the poem is long, but here's a kind of climax of it. Um, the, poets, the point of the poem is to compare the young Ishmaelite prophet to a mountain stream. He dances over the rocks, full of virile spirit. He's a kind of romantic hero. He originates, his source is heaven's rains, but is nonetheless part of the earth's nature. But his, his function is to bring life to it as a kind of romantic hero. And in this segment, you find that the Holy Prophet has figuratively become a great river whose fertilizing waters uh, conjure forth cities and great civilizations, but always, unlike Europe, directed towards God, the Altenbata, and the everlasting ocean, They're the place of return, the Ma'ad is there as well. So this is uh, the climax of the poem in a fairly literal English translation. And you can see the yearning Holy Prophet here presented in this moment of European literature as the romantic hero par excellence, the one who will reunite us to nature and who will gather up the lost children of the Heavenly Father and take us back to the ocean, the ocean of being. is working, I suppose, with Hafiz's conception of almost a kind of monistic understanding of the supreme being. 
Um, so with the rehabilitation of the Ishmaelite principle, one of the reasons for the existence of Islam, you might say, uh, the principle of prophecy in nature, we get this other dimension of Europe brought to the surface again. Europe is not just about Christianity versus paganism, but the old struggle between Christian and Saracen has now taken a new form because it turns out that the Saracen's way is attractive. This is what Roger Garaudet calls the, the third heritage, the Ishmaelite way of being uh, human in a non-pagan and monotheistic way that is actually also a natural way. In other words, the Hadrian principle, driven into the desert in her nice silk red dress because she's just about passion and the senses and maternity in a kind of materialistic way, as a kind of false soteriology, the, the false prophetess. She's now being belatedly called back, you could say. Europe is calling Hajar back again. So uh, Jeff Einboden, who studied at this university, has looked into this and particularly at Islamic themes in German romantic literature, has actually reminded us of the enormous importance of this um, in forming some of the key uh, assumptions of not just uh, European but also American literature. His most recent book is on uh, 19th century uh, American romantic poetry as essentially a reaction to translations of Sufi classics into the English language. Really interesting book. The trouble was this wasn't the way in which Europe ended up going. <coughs> This pun in Logos uh, was not the preferred option. Europe ended up increasingly uh, gravitating away from spiritual reactions to modern paradigms in favor of various clashing explorations of the meaning of scientific reductionism. We are just matter. What does this mean for our self-understanding as embodied human subjects? What can be a humanism that only believes in matter? And that comes to dominate the 20th century conversation. So let's now move away from the romantics, alas, um, towards some more uh, gritty 20th century uh, grapplings with the consequences of atheism and the rejection of the pagan paradigm and the rejection of the Hadrian paradigm. Here is one indicative figure, Filippo Marinetti, one of the most influential and turbulent of uh, early 20th century thinkers and artists. He was born in 1876 and brought up in Egypt, in Alexandria, part of the significant Italian colony there. His father was uh, working with the very modernizing Egyptian ruler, the Khadiv Ismail, who built the Suez Canal. He was in his employ. And then Marinetti moved to Italy where he experienced the kind of fast forward moment of the founding of the, uh, the consequences of the founding of the Italian Republic in places where the arrival of modern paradigms had actually come quite late, a little bit like the sense of accelerated change in many parts of the modern Muslim world that were almost medieval in people's lifestyle and worldview until very recently, and then suddenly they're being pushed into a world of postmodernism and Stephen Hawking's and very febrile, uh, unhappy, uh, explosive, unstable times. Italy was like that in the late 19th century. A huge battleground between Freemasons and communists and nationalists, uh, scientists. Uh, in fact, just about everything um, was in the air and available. Marinetti, I suppose you could describe as a kind of logical positivist. He believed in articulating and imposing a kind of optimistic, militant atheism <coughs> by using the power of art and the corporate state. He wanted to impose the new truths on everybody. For him, science had shown the falsity of the old religious stories. He didn't want Italy or the Western world to slide back into romantic dreams of knights errant or Ishmael or whatever else it might be, but we have to be honest and turn our sense of desolate aloneness in a godless universe into something that will actually benefit us. So we don't, we are not called just to turn our backs on the past for Marinetti, but we have to act, actively fight it. So he launched a very, well, everything in that age was extreme, but it's pretty extreme to call for the closure of all of Italy's museums and to destroy all the libraries 
and he wanted to destroy the city of Venice and turn it into a giant aeroplane factory. Uh, he saw this as just being the logical consequence of atheism and modernity. You have to grasp it by the horns. Don't try and get soppy and sentimental about nature and God. No, it's, oh, there is only matter. Uh, and the only sure guide to the human condition is Darwin. So he takes what Daniel Dennett calls Darwin's dangerous idea in directions that definitely were dangerous. Even consciousness, he said, is just brain function. And eventually it's going to be explained away in scientific reductionist terms. So he's actually one of the first theorists of artificial intelligence. It even seems that he invented the idea of the robot. The poupe électrique, he called it, the electric doll. And one of his plays is actually has robots um, um, on the uh, list of players. Uh, so really a kind of icon of a really honest uber-modernity. Now, this isn't the outcome that was dreamed of by either side, really, in the dichotomy explored by Goethe or by Ibsen. It's not Ishmaelite, it's not Galilean, it's an unflinching modernity. Matter alone is, and Marinetti was absolutely clear sighted about where it ought to go. So he was an immensely vigorous person, uh, and one of his most explosive works was his manifesto of futurism, published on the front page of the French newspaper Le Figaro in 1909. It was a sensation. And what he's saying is evolution shows us that we are creatures participating in nature, but not nature as something sacred, but we're just another part of the stuff of the world. We're a dimension of its strange onward and upward teleology. The strange thing about nature, as Darwin shows us, he thought, is that kind of, even though there's nothing there, it pushes us onward and upward. So natural selection explains absolutely everything that we are. And to deal with this, we have to embrace the fact, and we have to embrace our tools, which have made us you know, top dogs in the, uh, the battle of the species, particularly tools involving weapons and speed, because that's what gives us the, the edge. And in this way, we're going to find inner peace. Because in this way, we'll be conforming to how the world really is. We'll be conforming to the nature of the world and to ourselves. Evolution, the story of the blind watchmaker, has nothing moral about it. So he writes that, for instance, art can be nothing but cruelty, injustice, and violence. Romantic love has to be replaced with free love and the acceptance of all alternative sexualities. In a rather Nietzschean way, he thought that we are free when we're free from every kind of restraint. Very influential and one of the key tributaries in the whole modernist movement in art and to some extent uh, theatre as well. Um, a major shift in European sensibility. Go around, say, the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge and look at what art was like in 1900 and what it was like in 1920, and it's like the Renaissance, except now everything is kind of frantic and, and broken because no longer is there an underlying meaning or morality or sensibility or hope. There is only matter. And what's interesting is the vertiginous sense of standing at the edge of the void left by the absence of the Christian God. That's the essence, the dy dynamizing principle of the modern sensibility in art and music. The sheer vertiginous excitement of standing on the edge of nothingness, which was to replace the old sense of being drawn to the sacred and to salvation. So all of the old pre-Raphaelite soppiness was abolished and replaced by a materialistic art that insisted that we have to be true to our own selves, which are competitive, lustful, and magnificent. So. Uh, Groups that come out of this, Futurism was largely an Italian movement, even though everybody was very interested in it. Vorticism was, I suppose, its main UK extension, Wyndham Lewis, and uh, particularly in history of English sculpture, a lot comes from uh, Futurism and the focus on uh, machines and progress and technology and speed. Um, Dada also, these are both portraits of Marinetti, by the way. I'm not sure which is the least flattering, but probably like both of them. Um, love of angularity, love of movement, new revelation of mechanism, and a delight in senselessness. The void is really exciting. 
So we really owe a lot of the sensibilities of modern art, including everything from Gilbert and George to uh, Tracy Emin to uh, uh, the, all of the rest of them, the Brit art people, to this extraordinary moment of what Marinetti took to, took to be the only faithful way of, of being modern. No morality, no truth, no meaning, no symmetry, no aesthetics, only the excitement of the new and of competition and violence. So vertigo replaces piety. Here he is again. Another charming aphorism. Ours is a youthful and innovative banner, anti-traditional, optimistic, heroic and dynamic, that has to be hoisted over the ruins of all attachment to the past. We have to live in keeping with the harsh rules of history. And this means also that human beings are naturally divided. And to be truly ourselves, we have to be part of the Darwinian law Nature is red in tooth and claw, and hence tribal affiliation is essential to defining ourselves as human beings. So ideally, he thought the perfect form of the tribe is the modern Republican nation state. In order to reinforce the Darwinian truth that strength will prevail by using the latest technology. Everything is essentially a conflict, and it's only in conflict that we will, he thought, gloriously find ourselves. Conflict with the past, conflict with the church, with representational art, with sentimental fiction, with sexual restraint, with a class system, and of course, conflict with other nations. So a kind of uh, hypertrophic patriotism is also a part of this. Here's an example, and it really was an extraordinary modernity. Here is this most famous poem. You might think that doesn't mean anything, even if you know Italian. It's not supposed to mean anything. It's a sound poem. Uh, Marinetti was a, a war correspondent who was present at the Bulgarian siege of Edirne, a Turkish city, um, climax of the Balkan Wars towards the end of 1912. And in this uh, poem, which is entirely made up of warlike and mechanical sounds, it's a poem that tries to replicate the sound of aircraft and explosives and so forth. It's purely machine sound. And the point of this is to celebrate the victory of European military hardware over the primitive oriental civilization of Asiatic uh, Ottoman Turkey. So his early engagement with the uh, Khadiv's modernizing programs in, in Egypt here reaches a kind of consummation in this symphonic rendering of the sounds of batteries of artillery, artillery and air engines and so forth, as the Turkish city is smashed and reduced to submission, and the glory of Western man over the evolutionary dead end of Turkey is assured. Anyway, probably by now you have had enough of Signor Marinetti. His futurism, predictably enough, after the Great War morphs into Italian fascism and more or less disappears as recognizable artistic movement. Futurism had a future, but it wasn't called futurism. So I want to move on again now to reactions against Marinetti and where people who are bringing together the other significant others to European culture. And here is the first of the two ladies I want to introduce to you, very much part of the avant-garde in Paris at the time, uh, a dancer but also a widely published poet, Valentine de Saint-Point. Uh, there she is performing one of her uh, very experimental uh, uh, dance pieces. She was uh, very much a grand lady, grand niece of the philosopher Lamartine. She's from Masson, but she lived in Paris, very rich, uh, lots of leisure time. So she was kind of grand dame of the arts and held salons in her uh, beautiful flat in the 16th arrondissement. Uh, she was one of Rodin's models for a while and hung out with all of the avant-garde figures like Apollinaire and Picabia, and also published a lot of futurist poetry. In fact, she was the best-known female member of the futurist movement. OK, she also publishes manifestos. Marinetti has published his uh, manifesto, his futurist ma uh, manifesto. She breaks with him, um, even though he had published some of her poems, and really saw her as his leading exponent, the great futurist of, of Paris. But in 1912, she uh, creates a rift with her master with this document, 
Manifesto of Futurist Women. Uh, what's the manifesto about? Why is she doing it? Essentially, she's writing as a woman who is offended by Marinetti's very harsh reading of the doctrine of the selfish gene. For Marinetti, if you take Darwin seriously, we are only the product of natural selection. And primordial gender roles are the natural healthy state of the species. And Marinetti assumed that these were based on the kind of radical subjection of females that you get in other primates like chimpanzees and so forth. So for him, part of moving forward into the machine age is to recognize the natural subordination of women. And of course, she um, finds this a rather ungentlemanly thing. Uh, so these are two manifestos. I'll talk about the other one later. So on, on the left-hand side, manifesto of the futurist woman, and then the futurist manifesto of lust. It's a kind of metonym for nature and the rediscovery of nature, which we're going to talk about. So here you can see Marinetti, even though apparently the ladies loved him, wasn't particularly uh, gentlemanly in his opinions. Here he goes. We'll glorify war, the world's only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and scorn for woman. Whoops. So this is the, the question, really, that catalyzes her alienation from Marinetti's project. She remains wedded to many of the futuristic ideas. She doesn't think Christianity and the Catholic clergy um, have anything to offer. Um, she really believes we should be part of the logic of the natural world. She was also heavily patriotic throughout her life. She retained these elements. But his insistence on a Darwinian doctrine of humanity, survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and claw, amoral and successful wherever it turns women just into kind of subjugated reproduction machines, was just too much for her. And so they, they break, and this is something of a sensation in avant-garde circles at the time. There she is in her uh, apartment. And from this moment on, she develops a very distinctive voice, uh, which she raises through actually quite a wide variety of um, artistic genres. So this is from her refutation of the sort of extreme uh, sexism on steroids represented by these uh, modernists. Uh, the fecund periods, when the most heroes and geniuses come forth from the train of culture in all its ebullience, are rich in masculinity and femininity. Those periods that had only wars with few representative heroes because the epic breath flattened them out were exclusively virile periods. Those that denied the heroic instinct and turning towards the past annihilated themselves in dreams of peace were periods in which femininity was dominant. We're living at the end of one of these periods. That is why futurism, even with all its exaggerations, is right. So she likes, nowadays some would say, these uh, uh, illicit reifications or essentialisms about gender, but she's certainly working with them. There's the virile principle, which Marinetti takes to be the dominant principle, which is going to cleanse the world through war and technology. But there's also the feminine principle, and she wants uh, some kind of complementarity rather than this kind of um, hypertrophic extreme uh, virility. Um, I better move forward. Yeah, but she's a famous anti-feminist, which is one reason why she's not remembered very much nowadays, because she doesn't fit anybody's narrative, really. Um, she believes in a very kind of traditional sense of the male as linear and the female as inclusive, the maternal instinct, the earthly figure of, of the woman, woman's particular connectedness to nature. Um, so we must not give woman any of the rights claimed by feminists. To grant them to her would bring about not any of the disorders the futurists desire, but on the contrary, an excess of order. So what she seems to be saying there is that the futurists are saying push femininity out completely because it has no role to play in the new virile mechanistic future of aeroplanes and racing cars. She is saying uh, that uh, the feminine principle uh, must not be subverted by simply being defined in the conventional masculine terms. She doesn't want women to enter the professions and to become just like men. 
because she thinks society has to have this complementarity. So uh, she's a complementarist, technically speaking. Um, now, this other book that she uh, published, which is not really about eros as such, but is about the, the teleology of, of the body towards a legitimate participation in, in creation, which is essentially an anti-Christian uh, document. Um, uh, she here joins the perennial European debate over the body. We've seen Ibsen um, in a kind of state of permanent angst about it, and the pre-Raphaelites as well, not sure what to do. Like a lot of other radicals of her time, she, she typically identifies the church as a repressive principle which makes war on the body. It's dualistic. The spirit must be liberated and travel to heaven by the body being left behind. Uh, for her, the, the men and women of the future are to be liberated from the chains forged by the priests and the monstrous and inhuman fables which they teach to children. So here she's, as it were, taking Julian's side against Gregory or Hagar's side against the patristic consensus. Lots of pictures of her. I think she quite fancied herself, which is why there's so many photographs. Um, she was you know, celebrated. Now, how to articulate this? This new vision that she's developing. Well, her feud with Marinetti and the Futurist Project was expressed primarily through experimental dance, particularly a dance which she herself invented, which she calls rather obscurely la métacorie. Um, this image, incidentally, is of a modern experimental dancer, Maria Sideri. I don't think she's one of the Saudi Sideris. That's another branch, perhaps, of the family. And she's worked on recreations of this metachoric form, which is um, noted for the sort of full veiling of the, the dancer, and it's uh, quite unsensual in a paradoxical way. Now, she performs this in a variety of locations, including the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. And there's recently been quite a lot of academic interest in this and what she is trying to do. So an academic called Karl Verulich says, actually, this is the enactment of a kind of sacred principle. She's reacting against the futurists by using the body in order to indicate our irrefragable connectedness to the natural world. And um, Kandinsky, who she knew, um, was a devout theosophist, of course. And so there's speculation that this is influenced by theosophy. Um, the dance exists beyond and before its realization in performance. So one is acting out something that is part of the structure of, of, of creation, rather like the eurythmy of Rudolf Steiner um, and the anthroposophists. Uh, but she's kind of on her own. This is a great period for um, avant-garde dance in Paris. She doesn't like Nijinsky uh, or the ballet tradition. She sees it as rooted in a kind of perverse formalism, denying the natural fleshly architecture of the body. But also she doesn't like the kind of emotive subjectivism of somebody like Isadora Duncan, who just kind of flits around and lets it all hang out. Uh, instead, this metachory is an exploration of the body's relationship to geometrical shapes which define the physical world and which underpin its symmetries and for her its sacred uh, significance. So Günther Berghaus has also written about this metakori, says it's the power and beauty of the élan vital, the warm and vibrant force, and the physical richness of the Dionysian flux of life. Now this comes at a very significant time. Um, you might have heard of the famous scandal caused by the premiere of Stravinsky's ballet, The Rites of Spring, in 1913, when the Opera House was more or less turned into a battle zone because it was just so experimental and extraordinary. Stravinsky trying to recreate a pagan sensibility on stage with these kind of jerky marionettes. Uh, just a year before, his Petrushka had been more like a kind of classical ballet. And this time, the three or four years before the First World War is when these transitions are happening and modernity is really taking root. Uh, with the rites of spring, uh, gravity seems to, seems to have grabbed the dancers. You could say one of the features of modern dance is that it recognizes the power of gravity and the inexorable mortality of the dances, whereas the earlier forms of dance uh, aspired upwards. Um, so the modern dance seemed to be a way of getting away from the old Christian desire to, to float upwards.
constantly and to leave the earth. It seemed to integrate the soul and natural forces. So it's kind of pagan but futurist at the same time. So if you can read that, that's the program of the opening night of Hermete Corrie at the, uh, the, Met, the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. Um, and there she is. Um, it was, again, this is just before the First World War, so all of this gets erased and forgotten um, quite quickly. But it um, did create quite a splash at the time. Some more contemporary images of this metacori, these are images, uh, I guess, of her dancing that were done by various artists at the time. Um, okay, so uh, the significance of it, a lot of recent publications on it, this turn away from Marinetti's atheistic mechanism towards something that seems to be spiritual, that is not Christian, but is to do with the body's participation and, as it were, bodying forth of the symmetries and the geometrical forms of, of, of God's earth. There's been quite a lot of work done on this. So a work of art performed both instinctively and consciously, a synthesis that indicates the, the perfections of the human being, what we are supposed to be. It's an enactment. So this metachory, which means kind of a dance, but a meta-dance, a super dance, uh, aims at, as she says, a union of consciousness, the human reinsertion into nature. Uh, she says, à la fois spirituel et plastique. <coughs> the geometric archetypes, triangles, pentagrams, polygons, various forms which govern the movements, have, as she wrote, an esoteric meaning which cannot escape the interested spectator. Well, academics are still struggling to see exactly what the esoteric meaning is. But uh, the dance is, although it's an affirmation of nature, it really is emphatically not um, erotic. This is not Martha Graham or um, Isadora Duncan. The orientalist clothes, face veil, which she danced, to indicate that it's proclaiming a human subject that is almost in a state of annihilation, bodying forth the deep mathematical structures of the world that are beyond mere personality. It's at about this time also, we don't have an exact date, that she makes definitive her break with Marinetti by announcing her conversion to Islam, which apparently happens on a trip that she made to Tangiers. And it does seem that in her way she had found the resolution of this European dialectic in her turn towards the woman in red, towards Hajar, a form that reconciles uh, body and soul. This is, I suppose, her discovery of Ibsen's third empire. So 1925, she moves decisively to Egypt, where she becomes very active. She becomes uh, an agitator for Egyptian independence. There's her book on Sa'ad Zaglul. There's a picture of her looking very much the grande dame in a Egyptian newspaper, her book on Egypt, L'Egypte Florissante, a kind of real Egyptian nationalist, and uh, publishes a book also against French colonial excesses in Syria. Uh, she hadn't been terribly political before. When she moves to the Arab world as a Muslim, she really does get into these uh, anti-colonial issues, but also um, sort of observant, um, practicing the forms of Islam. And she dies at the age of 78, here is a, a, a magazine, a cultural magazine, which she uh, edited when she was in Egypt. In, uh, it's also about the regrowth, the rebirth of, of the Arab personality. She dies at the age of 78, and she's buried uh, right next to Imam al-Shafi'i, between Imam al-Shafi'i and Alayth bin Sa'ad. You know, she was genuinely devout and was recognized as such as Rohia Nur al-Din. Um, she was a real Muslim. Uh, I guess that was in the uh, early 1950s that she died. I, I knew people when I was in Egypt who'd known people in her circle, and she continued to publish poetry and was a significant figure who'd followed this trajectory. But what's this metakori about? That clearly is her great contribution. Uh, he's Saint Paul Roux, the, the tragic uh, French uh, poet. There's an image of one of these metachoric figures. Um, this was his view. She served the future of poetry by tracing the outline of the original world or Edenic paradise whose unity has been lost. 
The greatest human movements are nothing more than the image of the great cosmic motion. So there's something cosmological. This is the human being as, well, in turn, the sarir, if you like, the microcosm that indicates uh, the totality of, of God's, um, God's uh, world. Um, so this obviously is a long way from Marinetti. Uh, he also had had this idea, had ideas of how modern dance should be, futurist dance. So his most famous dances which he proposed and choreographed were called the dance of the aviator, the dance of the machine gun, and the dance of shrapnel. And that was where he was going. But for saint point by contrast, uh, there has to be a harmony which mirrors the harmony of nature indicated by the geometries of her dance. So the orchestra is playing Debussy, Ravel, Satie, and so forth. It's a harmonious thing. Ego is not paramount, unlike a lot of, say, Stravinsky. Ego is gone. Instead, there's a kind of human anonymous enactment, uh, almost like an arabesque of the repeated geometrical forms which indicate that behind nature there is an ordering principle. Um, and this idea of annihilation had been important to her. She also uh, had a play which she wrote, which was performed in Paris called Le Deschou, which is about how we're fully human only when we transcend our desires and are annihilated. And uh, the, the veil in these metachoric dances is another indication of that. So a lot more could be said about this moment in European culture. Um, to some extent, its purposes, the purposes of this dance do remain rather veiled, but its insistence on the enactment of the living body as a, a specimen of the world's meaning, a meaning which precedes the dance itself, so there's an archetype to this form, um, does seem to point to the idea of a live, lived cosmos which precedes observation and measurement. Human as in its embodiedness, a form of precognition, and the rejection of the formulaic and the linear in favor of an enfleshed but, but chaste sensuality. So it's a chiasm, if you know that word, C-H-I-A-S-M, an intertwining, preceding reason, exceeding reason. In it, we intuit a transcendence of our mere physiochemistry and enter a zone of pure life and perfection. Um, and the practice that she ended up was, of course, the namaz. Uh, Rod Blackhurst, the Australian scholar, has interesting article on the symbolism of Muslim prayer and the geometry, what happens to the body geometrically, algebraically, as it moves through the, the rakahs and the, the cosmic, uh, cosmological symbolism of it. This is from his article. Both the prayer times and the rakahs of the canonical prayer rehearse both astronomical and cosmic cycles. While the salat is ostensibly a restoration of the ancient Abrahamic prayer, these postures enact primordial and Edenic Adamic themes. Certain of the movements of the ritual also reenact the embryonic dead in their graves and their resurrection into the afterlife, the new cycle growing out of the earth like plants. When the Muslim prays, all of these parallels of symbolism are activated and by constant repetition, day after day, cycle after cycle, Islam hopes to actualize these symbols in the believer's soul. It seems to be rather like what Saint Paul Roux thought was going on in her Metakori. So that's the first of the two ladies that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the other one also comes out of Marinetti's circle. Leda Raffanelli, a little bit better known. Um, again, a person very individualistic and impossible to uh, characterize. There have been a number of recent books about Valentin de Saint-Point. Uh, Adrian Sina has the best known one. Um, Leda Raffanelli has been served by um, a uh, lady called Pacquiaser, I think, Andrea Pacquiaser, who is a, at the, the Sorbonne, has a, a book on Raffanelli. So 1880, 1971, kind of contemporaries. Again, one of Marinetti's most avid associates. Uh, and when she was very young, in her early 20s, she founded a political publishing house which published Marinetti's writings and also did things like, for instance, publishing the first complete Italian version of the works of Friedrich Nietzsche. And she started a career as a novelist and a typesetter. Um, she, uh, in 1900, also ends up in Alexandria. She moves to Egypt, associating mainly with anarchist circles there. Throughout her life, she's, uh, anarchism is her political 
uh, position, and she marries somebody called Luigi Poggi, who's one of the main figures of Luigi Polli, one of the main figures of Italian anarchism at the time. Remember, Italy, again, is this kind of extraordinary bubbling cauldron of every possible ideology, and anarchism was uh, one of the most significant. And she uh, starts to produce uh, fiction. Un sogno d'amore is the first one in 1904. She has a romantic liaison with uh, Benito Mussolini, who at that time is still a socialist. And after the Second World War, she publishes their love letters, um, uh, which uh, actually, if you're interested in that particular epistolary genre, Mussolini was very, very, very good at writing love letters. And, uh, so she, she published these after the war, basically, because she was uh, completely bankrupt and needed uh, uh, an income. But yeah, she was close to Mussolini for a while. Um, but of course, when Mussolini moves into his fascist mode, actually he sends his uh, brown shirts to smash up her publishing house, one reason why she experienced such uh, poverty. Uh, but still, enormously prolific. She never stopped writing. These are just some of her writings. 15 novels published, 49 short stories, hundreds of essays. It's really in the novels that you find her developing critique of the modern project. Seems very political, very anti-colonial, anti-bourgeois, but also working with perhaps problematic, slightly hackneyed images of the, the Romantic East. Uh, a certain Orientalist elision of the Romantic East with, with the Bohemian. Uh, she, again, violently attacks Catholicism because of its war on the body and its identification with the, with the political status quo. And in many of these novels, she proposes an alternative to Europe, which is an ideal kind of mashrik, where nature and a kind of supercharged life force replace the linearity of the West with something sinuous, indirect, and a frank embrace of a kind of naturalistic fallacy. It's only by rejecting the church and by the Cartesian dualism that separates us from nature that we're going to find inner peace and, as a result, social justice. Um, you find this very emphatically in her early works, and it's there in her correspondence with Mussolini, certainly. Eventually, it becomes the discourse of uh, an embodiedness that in the uh, fullness of uh, its acceptance of biology saves human beings from the, the brutal consequences of a machine age. So she surprises uh, Mussolini by, like Saint-Point, uh, converting to Islam, which she seems to have done during her stay in Alexandria, and she remains a faithful Muslima for the rest of her life. And there's been a surge of interest in her in Italy recently. This is the, the flyer for uh, a recent uh, exhibition, a set of performances based on her life, particularly anarchist circles in uh, Italy now are very fond of Raffanelli. The kind of anarchism she supported was a kind of individual anarchism. She didn't think there should be structural changes in society, it, but there has to be, first of all, an inner discipline of change. Oppressive structures in the soul have to be overcome. There's been inner liberation. So uh, at this time, uh, she, still before the First World War, she establishes one of Italy's best-known anarchist magazines, La Sciarpa Nera. Um, I mentioned that she was connected to dear old Marinetti. There's another picture of him, looking very futuristic. Um, he was very much a comrade in arms. Um, as I mentioned, she was publishing some of his, his outputs. But she breaks with him the way Saint-Point did. And Saint-Point moves away from him because of his insistence that a scientific view has to regard women as necessarily radically subservient. Um, the catalyst here for uh, Raffanelli was actually musical. Uh, it was the performance in a Milan theater of a concert uh, by an instrument which Marinetti had himself invented. He thought that since Darwin and science had proved that traditional ideas about harmony and rhythm and tunes were kind of vacuous, we can only accept efficient mechanical sounds as being consonant with our true nature. So he invented a new, a new musical instrument called the noise intoner. 
as the instrument in question, which was to generate sounds that were purely mechanical and were about the way in which humanity was now going to go. So no myth of harmony or the idea of uh, the, the music of the spheres. This is a music for uh, our uh, fast-moving modern age. So this was performed to uh, an audience in Milan. Raffanelli was present. And this is what she recalls. Quite amusing. As the wooden wheels turned, producing shrill and discordant sounds, there was an almost fearsome reaction from the audience, and various projectiles began to fall onto the stage, first happily welcomed by the leader, it's Marinetti, who began to peel an orange that fell near him, <laughs> but then received apprehensively by those present in the front of the audience, as now pieces of wood and stone began to fly. <laughs> Suddenly, from high up, a chair sailed through the air. The futurists, who had maintained their distance from the fracas, were lucky since small groups representing different ideological trends also came to blows. So uh, this really is her uh, moment of truth. She's not going to buy into futurism. Uh, this is her shift. Uh, she brings into her discourse she also has a thing about uh, the body and chastity and uh, is particularly offended by the Western Christian, specifically Catholic, insistence that spiritual e excellence can only be cultivated in uh, co the context of vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. And in an Italian context, this was particularly important and particularly outrageous. So she has a polemic against religion but uh, on behalf of what she calls fede, which is faith. So uh, she makes the rather standard point about the degeneracy of religious structures. As free spirits, we will always object to how religious movements, which over the years have moved away from their legendary and luminous origins, degraded and darkened by their own clergy, disguise entirely material interests with statements that are more useful to certain men, certainly, than the gods they claim to represent. Priests do not neglect their ordinary human needs. They have no faith, fede, only religion. So spirituality, yes. The church, absolutely not. Uh, but more often, a uh, uh, very <coughs> idiosyncratic blend of Islam with anarchism, with the class struggle, with a return to nature, with anti-clericalism, all of these kind of ingredients bubbling away in the pot of our mind, uh, uh, expressed itself in terms of the need for social liberation. Uh, so this is quite characteristic of her writing in the period. We know that while one class squanders away in luxury, the other class, which achieves whatever luxury it has through work, suffers from the cold, hunger, distress, and fatigue. We know that for every 100 bourgeois women wearing silk garments, thousands of proletariat women fall ill with tuberculosis in the spinning mills. We know that behind the opaque splendor of every little pearl on your necklaces looms the gloomy shadow of an indigenous diver who died while harvesting oysters. So what you uh, note is, uh, it sounds like uh, the Communist Manifesto, but it's actually better written. She was really, at her best, she was a good Italian uh, prose stylist, but not advocating some kind of uh, forced egalitarianism imposed by the dictatorship of the proletariat, but more something individualistic based on the idea of self-improvement and a revolution within. The more human beings can govern themselves, the less they're going to need government. Here she is again. We must admit that almost all of us live badly without any comprehension of what our lives consist of, spiritually and materially, without ever questioning why we do what we do, without ever analyzing the value and social utility of our acts, which implies individual responsibility, even if it is solely performed to meet the needs of living and feeding ourselves without ever reflecting upon the sacred importance of each and every one of our actions, whether the more common acts of putting food into our mouths or the poison of fermented drink, or more complex acts driven by our sensibility. So another thing she often writes about is, I guess what we've been hearing about today, mindfulness, that there is a kind of ruffler 
or heedlessness, distractedness, which the modern condition in particular can generate. And here she is lamenting the fact that we're kind of comatose going through our lives in this uh, anaesthetized state. Here is something from a very beautiful Italian essay. Uh, this is uh, quite prophetic in a way. Understanding life and living it serenely, happily, in a blossom of joy, in a constant and intense, full affirmation of love, giving life to healthy fruit, offering all of our brothers and sisters affectionate and constructive acceptance, understanding the inevitable pain and remaining calm throughout mortal struggles, all with knowing awareness and a sense of peace. This is the human mission, and all who strive to fulfil it do not live in vain. So there is a, uh, an emphasis on some form of spirituality, which in this form of her life is kind of rather vaguely articulated. Uh, and again, just like Saint-Point, she uh, is allergic to feminism. Strong language here. Uh, but for slightly different reasons. Feminism is a poisonous fruit of modern society that strives to do nothing else than create female attorneys who, just like male lawyers, will be perfectly useless in the society of the future as soon as we, the people, render laws and courts useless and therefore eliminate them. So here she seems to be against the feminist idea that women should enter the professions because in her anarchistic future there aren't going to be any professions anyway. All of these complex regulated structures and disciplines and guilds uh, are going to be done away with in favour of some kind of uh, uh, flux. <laughs> ah, and there she is uh, again. Yeah, so a strong anti feminist. Um, she has a, a book, Donna e Femine, 1922. First chapter is called First Day of Ramadan, 1339. Uh, and she says that women can rise to spiritual heights by experiencing the greatness of womanhood, which includes the control of passion. She saw a lot of feminism of her, a lot of the feminists of her day as being ruled by a kind of will to power, a kind of willfulness, a kind of ego. And that was one reason, it seems, why she was against it. Yeah, so here's a kind of simple, maybe simple-minded aphorism. Our modern sense of alienation is not, as Marx thought, due to our distance from the factors of production, but because we're distant, exiled from nature. She writes a lot about nature and our embodied subjectivity. Nature's laws are going to help us overcome that alienation. You can see some kind of root in this in Marinetti's project that Christianity has alienated us from nature and science emphasizes that there is only nature, so we're part of it. But she does this in a very specifically Islamic way in her slightly Orientalist Muslim attire, devotional practices. Um, she, like saint Point, thought that she had found ritual and social forms which reconnected her with the body and the cycles of the natural world. Um, for her, Islam is simply a kind of natural law, din al fitra, I guess. Um, as a study of Arabic and the Qur'an progresses at the beginning, at the time of her conversion, she doesn't really seem to know much about Islam other than some romantic idea of the mystic East, but she does teach herself Arabic and uh, studies the Qur'an and then develops more articulate idea uh, that it is only through this sound natural disposition, what Muslims call fitra, that you can successfully access God's speech, both his uh, signs in scripture and also the order of creation. So uh, there's a picture of her in a recent uh, cartoon book. Uh, here she's talking about the book, but the book of nature. How do we intuit the divine through intuiting the divine through signs in nature? So for Saint-Point, it had been through seeing the underlying geometries and symmetries that uh, are the support, the armature of the forms and consistencies of the physical world, indicating the existence of the, the designer. For uh, Raffanelli, it's a more kind of intuitive process. So this is how she reflects on it. It's a difficult subject. 
It's not enough to have goodwill or tenacity or even extraordinary intelligence in order to read that book, in other words, to get the true meaning, the real nature of nature. One needs to be adapted to that purpose, to have powers that are not necessarily superior, but are different from those held by people who cannot practice this apostolate. Not everyone, even if they slowly walk across the ground holding a willow branch in their hand, will become a water diviner. So she's dealing here with the deep mystery of why it is that some people can see the sanctity of nature and of things and of people, while other people are, uh, are blind. Of course, the opening verses of Surat al-Baqarah are about this. Some people have a seal set over their hearts. And here she's reflecting this rather nice image that we go through the world looking for God, looking for the sacred, like the water diviner, the dowser, with the dowsing stick in his hand. And it kind of happens without our uh, bidding, but there has to be a certain inner uh, aptitude or sensibility that makes that uh, possible. So uh, she remains very uh, keen uh, in her Islam, although it seems that uh, she never actually joined formally a Muslim congregation or a tariqa. This time, even in the mid-20th century, there were very, very few Muslims living in Italy, but she was very much a kind of individualist. Um, um, even in the 1960s, there wasn't much of a Muslim population in Italy, but uh, still quite uh, a fighter. So a newspaper article in the, I think it's a Milanese newspaper, Corriere della Sera, was kind of poking fun at her as this kind of orientalist woman with her exotic clothes and her talk of the mystic East, <laughs> um, <coughs> publishing a kind of lurid article saying she was a kind of gypsy not who'd renounced normal Italian life. She writes a fiery letter towards the end of her life uh, along these lines, which do give an insight into her commitment. My name is, not my name was, Leda Raffanelli, as I'm still alive and, inshallah, in excellent health, thanks to my lifestyle, nourishing my body with the yoga method and practicing the ritual of Ramadan. I was not a fanatic of the Muslim religion because I'm a faithful and practicing follower of Islamic law, expert in the Arabic language, and still an individualist, anarchist activist. Perhaps my extravagance is due to the fact that I have remained faithful to my ideas and to my Mohammedan religion. So if there's anything odd about her, she thought, it's the fact that I'm an anarchist, but also uh, really practicing the religion of Islam. She's come a long way um, from the days of Marinetti. So one of the people um, who was alive, you could talk to him quite recently, uh, who knew her quite well, kind of living link with the past, was um, Gabriele Mendel, who is a professor of um, psychology at Milan University, died just a couple of years ago, who wrote a lot of books uh, and did a full Italian translation and commentary on the Holy Quran. Um, uh, and this is his book on her, Leda Raffanelli tra letteratura anarchia. And he likes to see her very much as being in the Sufi tradition as with saint Juan, but that's what they were, but that's what everybody was before the rise of modern fundamentalism. The idea that there could be an Islam divorced from its inherited spiritual forms would have been just odd to suggest to Muslims in the early 20th century. So here is Gabriele. Sufism is above all else an Islamic method of internal perfection, of balance, a source of deeply felt and gradually ascending fervor. Far from being an innovation or divergent parallel path to canonical practice, it's primarily a resolute mark of a category of stricken souls, thirsty for God, moved by the shock of his grace to live only with him, and thanks to him within the framework of his connected, internalized, tested uh, law. He was an interesting guy. He was a murid for a while of Sidi Hamza Boubacar, who was the rector of the main mosque in Paris. But he went back a long way. Uh, he was with Italian partisans as a Jew and was actually tortured by the Nazis during the Second World War and has some Sufi novels. Um, uh, so uh, author of, of dozens of books and he's somebody who's been working to keep the memory of this rather private uh, person alive. That's one of her pieces of calligraphy and that inshallah is the end of this presentation. Sorry for going on so long but the basic point has been to take you on this rather large sort of meta-historical journey through an essentially European narrative. I'm not talking about Middle Eastern Islam, subcontinental Islam, 
the glories of Turkish Islam, but what happens when the European oscillation between various others, Christianity, paganism, letter, spirit, body, flesh, soul, uh, uh, and also the Ishmaelite possibility, the Hagerine possibility, Europe's third heritage, come together in the extraordinary ferment of the 20th century to produce these individuals who are kind of bringing things together in a way that represents not the importation of an Eastern Islam into a Western city, but the continuation of the West's and Europe's own internal arguments and linear narrative. So this is, if you're looking for that will-o'-the-wisp thing called European Islam, this is the kind of place to find it. Not Muslims who come to Europe and become Europeans, there's a, w a positive way of doing that, but Europeans who are continuing with their narrative and discovering in Islam the resolution, the, the Ishmaelite way, uh, the third empire, pan in logos, uh, logos in pan. Barakallahu fikum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.